morning, everybody. My name is Raquel Black. I am Kia'ani, born for Sanju Kinneth. My Chays are Ashinghe and my Nellies are Totojitni. I'm Navajo from the community of Shanto, Arizona, and I'm the co-working manager for Change Labs. <clears throat> so thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, first off, I'd like to give a brief overview of what Change Labs is and what we do for those of you who aren't familiar with what we, uh, our organization. Uh, officially, Change Labs is a native-led and native-controlled nonprofit organization based on the Navajo and Hopi reservations. Here at Change Labs, our goal and our mission is to provide creative workspace tools, resources, and knowledge for native entrepreneurs. How we accomplish our goals and mission is through our different programs. <clears throat> we have our co-working program, our business incubator program, and our kinship lending program currently. We also have exciting programs and plans coming up, and those will be announced at a later date. Uh, here are the different programs that Chains Lab currently has, just to give you a visualization. And here is our mighty team of three, six, nine, ten people now. We had a really big growth spurt in the last year. We welcome Cecilia So, Holly Patterson, Swarovski Little, and myself to the Chains Lab team within the last year. We also have Jessica Stago, our founder, co-founder, and um, incubator coach, as well as many other things. <clears throat> we have our coaches, Joe, Joe Elliott Nez and Tim Deal. And then our kinship lending director is Christine Laughter. And we have Marsha Gray Eyes, our finance director. And then our head honcho, Heather Fleming, our executive director. Uh, to talk a little bit about the co-working program, we do have construction currently underway on our new headquarters, which is located right next to the Tuba City Chapter House on Main Street. <clears throat> for, for those who may not be familiar with what a co-working space is, it's a community space um, for business owners and entrepreneurs to use to help operate and manage your business. Uh, this space in particular will serve, will serve our Native entrepreneurs and small business owners, especially those based on the Navajo and Hopi nations in the Four Corners area. So later this year, we will have a brand new co-working space available for you to use. And some of the services that we'll be able to offer are some tools that could be useful to you. Um, tools such as desk face, uh, Wi-Fi access, color printing, uh, in-person coaching sessions, and a lot more. We know that across the reservation, it's really hard to, for those of us especially working uh, remotely, it's hard to find a space to pop up, set up, and have a quick meeting or get some quick um, tasks done online on our laptops. So this is a space where you can come and you can access Wi-Fi, you can access printing and um, mingle with other entrepreneurs in our community. <clears throat> uh, we also plan to bring back monthly in-person trainings for those who are interested. And our list of co-working services are constantly being updated um, as far as how we support our entrepreneurs and our communities. And we're always open to other ideas um, that you may have. So please feel free to let us know if there's something that we can do to provide a service to you at this co-working space. We're really excited to bring this to our community for everyone and to help build and grow your business. So please stay tuned for more information as we come closer to completion of our construction, which is very, very soon now. And we will be having celebrations on the opening of that space. Moving along. One of the most popular questions that we get here at Chains Labs is how do I start a business? Um, all of our programs and services here are designed to help entrepreneurs, our artisans, our local vendors, and those we like to ch call change makers, because that's what our local business owners and our entrepreneurs are, they're change makers. And if you're a native entrepreneur or a small business owner yourself, please know that you're absolutely crucial for our economies and <clears throat> our native peoples and Change Labs is here to help you both start up and strengthen your businesses. Now for a brief overview of the business incubator program, um, this is one of the only native led business incubators for native entrepreneurs in this country. And we're right here on the Navajo Nation, right next to the Hopi Nation as well. And right now uh, this program is led by our director of incubation, Cecilia So. And starting this year, it is a six month program for native entrepreneurs who want, to, who want support and training on how to start and operate your business. If you're interested and would like to assistance with things like your logo and your website design or how to set up and maintain your bookkeeping and finances, please visit our website here for more information at nativestartup.org incubator. 
And then next is another question that we get often is how do I get help running my business? There are so many aspects to being an entrepreneur and the answer or solution that you're looking for to um, help your business may not always be obvious. Here at Chain Labs, <clears throat> one of our driving factors is ki kinship, uh, building relationships among our communities and networks and across our, the nation. And how Chain Labs can help there is through our business coaching appointments. We offer free virtual 90 minute appointments with any of our business coaches on the Mondays. <clears throat> and very soon uh, we'll have other days available with our new coaches that are coming on staff. Um, we have a team of very, very bright e and eager coaches that are incredibly knowledgeable in all their specialties. And they'll be able to assist you in the areas that you're needing help with your business. The coaches are available to assist you in areas from marketing to accounting and bookkeeping systems. Or if you're just starting out, uh, they can assist you with creating a business model um, and navigating the Navajo Nation system for things such as your business site lease your, or registering with the Navajo Nation business regulatory, which we really, really encourage. Uh, this coming Monday, um, I'm not sure who our coach is. I believe it's Coach Christine this coming Monday. <clears throat> um, you can go to our site here at nativestartup.org slash events to book an appointment with this coming Monday's coach or any of our following our coaches for the following Mondays. Um, so just be sure to recognize, um, note which days which coach is assigned to. And then another common question that we get here at Chains Labs is how do I create a website? Until Chains Labs can go back to hosting open hour studios at our headquarters in Tuba City, I'll refer you to our YouTube channel. We currently have over 50 recorded sessions and discussions, each led by Native business owners and um, Native entrepreneurs and other creators. Our workshops have covered topics like social media marketing, website design, doing business on the Navajo Nation, and a lot more. It's a growing archive of shared knowledge from other Natives <clears throat> who really just want to see our Native people thrive and their businesses thrive. To access all of our past sessions and our listings of resources as well, I'll refer you to our link here, the nativestartup.org slash resources. We update this page pretty regularly, so be sure to check in every now and then for upcoming opportunities for yourself and your business or even other people that you know. Um, it's all open to the public. It's not exclusive to just Change Labbers and our cohort members. Another great resource we have to offer are our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. <clears throat> I do recommend that you check out those pages as well for regular postings and updates. Uh, Chains Labs likes to share posts on, from many of our partners and others in our networks for great opportunities and resources that we feel are important to you as a business owner and entrepreneur, and then for your business itself. And then lastly, there's a whole spectrum of who we consider Native entrepreneurs and business owners, and we here at Chains Labs have been cur curating a list of them. And if you're in the market for finding other native service providers who can help you with your business, we currently have over 600 native owned businesses listed in here and we, that we think are really, really great resources for helping to start up and run your business. Or maybe you're searching for some native made products or you can visit the site here at resrising.org. And if you're a native business owner and entrepreneur yourself you can, and you have services and products that you'd like to promote and market, <clears throat> Uh, feel free to add yourself to the listing here. It's free for you, and it's a very pretty simple process to get started. All right. If you have any questions at all about Chains Labs and our services and you want to know where to start, you can feel free to email me. My direct email is raquel at nativestartup.org, or you can visit Chains Labs' website at nativestartup.org. All right, now before we get started with our guest speaker for today, I wanna to touch on our workshop etiquette <clears throat> and how we can be respectful of her time. Uh, we do ask that you stay on mute during the presentation unless you're called upon, but do please feel free to populate the chat box with your questions and we'll make try to make sure that we get to all of them before we end the session today. Um, if Jessica allows, we can also um, have you raise your hand, your little virtual hand, and then we'll get to your questions in the order. And then also a reminder, our session is being recorded today and will be available on Chains Lab's YouTube channel later on this week. All right, and now introducing our guest for today, Jessica Stago. <clears throat> um, she has a lot of titles and um, very, very impressive titles. And among those, she's the co-founder of Chains Labs and a pro program director for Chains Labs as well. And in her extensive background in business counseling and starting businesses on the, all over the Navajo Nation uh, really makes her a powerful ally 
<clears throat> for Navajo startup, Native startups. Uh, she's Dine in Apache and of the Bethany clan. And today she's going to be talking about, her workshop is titled Imagining an Indigenous Tourism Economy. So we're going to talk about tourism. Thank you, Jess, for being here today. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Raquel, for that wonderful introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for attending the workshop today and um, really excited to talk about tourism. And um, I think all of us have some sort of um, some sort of impact on tourism or are impacted by tourism. So I think it's a really important topic and we'll get into um, what what it's what a lot of our communities do for tourism, but also how um, the different ways people feel about tourism. And um, I'm also gonna sort of introduce you to another um, aspect of the work that I do. Um, it's still surrounding entrepreneurship and supporting entrepreneurs, um, but it's more directed toward um, looking at the industries that we have in our region and how entrepreneurs can take part in those um, industries. And of course, tourism is a huge industry in the region, mostly because of the Grand Canyon. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and start my presentation. So you have some nice pictures to look at. Today, we're gonna be talking a lot about um, or we're going to be talking about imagining an indigenous tourism economy for our region. And the um, again, this is part of the work that I do with the Grand Canyon Trust. Um, I lead a team over there that's looking at building an indigenous economy in the region. And one of our projects is um, a event that we hosted um, in partnership with the Grand Canyon National Park, and it was hosted at the South Rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, so we'll talk about that event and uh, what came of that event, the discussions that we had, and the information that I can share with you today. So this is going to be sort of what we'll do today. We'll, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and also sort of my personal story around tourism. And then we'll um, talk about emergence and some of the common themes that came out of emergence. And then we'll talk about potential opportunities for entrepreneurs uh, at the Grand Canyon and um, within the Grand Canyon tourism uh, region. So that's what we'll do today. Um, but right now I just kind of want to see who's in the audience. So if you could put in the chat, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a community leader, if you're a policymaker, uh, a concerned citizen or an artist and you can put as many um, things as you put into as you consider yourself so you could be both a policymaker and an artist or an entrepreneur and a concerned citizen um, so I'm going to open up my chat here and so I can see some of the um, the answers because I think that tourism is one of those industries that everybody has some sort of role um, or it impacts you in some in some way. So it's a big discussion and um, it also has a big impact on the future of our economy and the future of our communities. And it's just also a huge opportunity for people in our communities to establish a business, to um, export a product or service to visitors or to people that are that live outside of our region and then how does that actually work like how does that how does that work to build the economy what's the impact of that on the economy and also what are the cultural what's the cultural context that we see tourism um, when we think about visitors coming to our our homeland or visitors coming to the region um, you know, how do we want to be portrayed? How, how do we want to control the impact on our lives? Um, and all of those sort of um, cultural context issues that we don't really get to talk about. So that's what I'm hoping to do today and to share what the discussions that we had at Emergence. So I'm seeing many entrepreneurs, um, concerned citizens, artists, 
um, consultants. And um, so it's really great to have sort of an all around um, audience. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from you all about how you feel about tourism and what you'd like to see in your community. So if you do have a chat or a question that you put in the chat and I don't see it, um, feel free to unmute and just verbalize your question or um, some of Raquel or Holly can let me know as well. Um, this is more of a discussion, so feel free to jump in whenever you like. If you have a question or a comment or you want to um, share a story, um, that's perfectly fine with me. So, um, and then we'll, I'll manage the time. So um, I'll move us forward. And so that we can get to the uh, activity at the end, which is um, where we'll really have some interaction. interaction. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put this slide up there, which is about emergence, but um, just to kind of share with you a little bit about why I'm so interested in the tourism economy, aside from the fact that it's just a huge industry that we already um, are a huge part of. We have many, many of our family members benefit from the tourism industry. Many of us ourselves benefit from the tourism industry. Um, but of course, we all we all see issues with it as well. And um, for me, my family are silversmiths. And so I, I grew up going to tourism places um, to sell jewelry. And we sell mostly wholesale to, um, when I was growing up, we would sell mostly to the stores, the retail shops. So I go, we went to Sedona quite a bit, but we'd go all over the region. Um, we'd go into Albuquerque, Santa Fe, Taos. We used to go to Taos every summer, once a, once a year just to, to sell jewelry there. And that used to be my favorite thing. I used to love going there. Um, and because I was, I was pretty young, so we would get to Taos and we'd usually be there for several hours because my family would be going to each of the little shops to, to see people and then they knew people so they were visiting and I would just get to play like in the <laughs> in the village area. Um, and so it was really fun for me. And that's kind of the experience that I grew up with um, going to Tucson, Phoenix, um, even as far as like Palm, Palm Springs, California. Um, but usually our, our once or twice a week trips were Sedona or the Grand Canyon. And one of the things that um, I, I noticed quick, I noticed as, a, as I was growing up that when we went to the Grand Canyon, um, we would go there and we would sell, you know, we'd sell the jewelry, but we never did anything else. We never stayed there to, um, you know, experience what the tourists experience we would just go there, sell jewelry right there at the um, Hopi house, and then we would leave. And sometimes we would stop at the at one of those rim views, and uh, my aunt would let us um, sort of run around a little bit or look at the at the canyon. Um, but not for very long. We always, you know, were trying to get to somewhere else in the same day. So I think that's why we never really did anything there. And it wasn't until just a few years ago, I actually um, hiked the Bright Angel Trail for the first time. And I wrote about this in, in an article. And um, one of the reasons I think was that, and I, you know, sharing with some of the, um, an organization that we work with at the trust called the um, ICCG, the Intertribal um, Grand Canyon, um, group, intertribal centennial group. They were a group of elders that started sort of guiding us on how to work with the Grand Canyon National Park. And they had a vision for what the next 100 years would be at the canyon. And they started talking about how, um, you know, it's great that the Grand Canyon is there, but really the national park represented um, a really horrible history of removal and, um, you know, removing the Havasupai, removing Wallapai from the canyon and from their homelands so that the park could be there, but also in the way that our cultures are represented and um, 
exclusion from really the this huge economic impact in the region. Um, and it went, we had to, you know, they talked about the, um, the idea of reselling culture and reselling, you know, the products that were made by indigenous people. And that got me thinking about my own experience. And I realized, you know, growing up that we were only paid about 30 cents on the dollar of what our, the products we were selling to the, to really all retail places in the region. Um, anything, you know, the wholesale price that we were, we were selling to these institutions was only about a third of the actual value um, and probably less at the time, the actual value of what we were selling. So they were reselling these products for three or four times more than what they were buying from us. And we accepted that. And I think we just didn't, well, I know that we didn't realize it. And it wasn't until I was, um, you know, out of college and thinking back on my own experience, um, what was actually happening as I was growing up. And so it got me thinking about the value that we bring in the tourism industry and um, how we benefit very little from that value. And so then it's, you know, of course, I'm working with entrepreneurs and also looking at the vendors um, that are around the Grand Canyon area in Cameron. Um, now the, the business has shifted a little, a little bit where my family doesn't actually, um, doesn't do too much wholesale to retail shops. They now wholesale to the vendors. And um, they, it is a more equitable partnership because they they feel more comfortable and they have relationships with these vendors that they negotiate better prices. They negotiate um, with these other native businesses to sell their products. And that kind of happened organically. And so how do we sort of take that sort of negotiation and that willingness to partner um, and expand that into some of the other uh, parts of the industry? So we sort of brought that 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 um, spirit of partnership, and also of um, looking at the history of the Grand Canyon and of the national park, and working with the Intertribal Centennial Group to bring about emergence and to um, facilitate these discussions. And so we had this last year in August of 2022. We actually had planned this for 2020. Uh, we had to cancel because of the pandemic and we um, canceled again in 2021. So we finally were able to host it in 2022. And so some of the, um, the common themes, some of, well, let me kind of explain some of these pictures. So we had the national park director who was an indigenous person for the first time, the first indigenous national park director, Chuck Sams, who, um, came to emergence to hear these discussions and to have um, discussions and negotiations with us. Um, we held a series of um, the, the, the event itself was three days and it had um, some panels. It had um, some facilitated workshop style discussions. And we also had um, two of our uh, two tours that we took with the park service and one of them was at desert view and so that's the the larger picture on here and that's actually marcia there <laughs> one of our coaches who attended um but desert view is going through some um they're doing new construction there they partnered with a group of native park service employees just to design a new experience at desert view and so the joke is kind of like Desert View is like the Grand Canyon Res, because <laughs> that's where they kind of put all the native, the 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 indigenous and native um, experiences there at Desert View. Um, so we we had a discussion about expanding that across the the canyon and across the national park, and also the fact that Desert View is really far from the Grand Canyon Village. Um, it's probably the furthest away from the Grand Canyon Village where that's where where all the tourists all um, come to the Grand Canyon, they go into the village. So it's a high traffic area. 
So to put Desert View way out at the end of the park is kind of, our, or well, Desert View was already out there, but to put all of the native um, um, experiences and the, um, the interaction with native people and culture there at Desert View is sort of, you know, um, again, just sort of isolating the native people to a certain area of the park. So one of the discussions we had was about how do we take what's happening at Desert View and, and um, do projects similar to that across the park area. So we'll talk about one project. We had um, Chef Carlos Deal, who is a grand, uh, who is a Change Labs um, graduate. He was the uh, event chef, um, and he led a team of five or six um, cooks. And one of them was Tyrone Thompson. And a lot, all of the uh, vegetables that came from our meals came from Tyrone's farm, Chigi Farms, which who's also a, a Change Labs graduate, and they just did such a great job of providing food there to everybody. Everybody was so amazed by them. And Carlos did a really good job of explaining um, the food that he was serving and the inspiration behind it. And so um, it was, again, just sort of this, this um, demonstration of Native talent and, and Native culture. Um, so those are some of the, the, the photos that I have here on this slide. And then the common themes, um, for sure the biggest, team, the biggest theme throughout the, the three days was, the, um, was about inclusion, about um, the idea that, you know, there should be nothing about us without us. So making sure that any policies that are being considered by the Grand Canyon, and when they say they wanna, they wanna, um, they want to support native entrepreneurs or native culture, or they want to increase representation in the park. That that's all done with direct communication from tribal communities, from um, indigenous organizations, and from also the um, native staff at the park. And so that was a big discussion and a common theme across all of the different facilitated panels and workshops. Um, and then the second one was about equity and collaboration. And this is where, you know, there was um, some facilitated discussions between some of the, the, um, the park staff, the artists, the entrepreneurs that have tried to work with the park, and also the concessionaires there that have these contracts with um, the national park and how, um, and the idea of, you know, paying an equitable amount uh, for the products and services that they buy from Native entrepreneurs. And how does that actually happen? How does, you know, what's the, the mechanism for that um, to happen? Or how does the National Park support um, greater representation in the retail center of Grand Canyon Village? And so we'll talk about one of the, the projects that comes, uh, comes from that. And then the second or another theme was um, about cross marketing, about increasing the visibility of native owned businesses in the park and native owned products. Um, and also um, the way that we're represented there through um, in terms of our culture and the different cultures. There's 11 tribes that have a connection with the Grand Canyon um, in terms of either their um, sacred spaces or um, the stories that they have, their creation stories, um, or even, you know, how um, they feel about the, the activities that are already happening um, in terms of the river guides or the guides, the, the guided tours down in the park. Um, and, you know, what are the, what are their feelings about that? And this is where the um, ICCGs discussions came into play and the ability for um, these elders, there's a lot of elders on the ICCG group, which is the Intertribal Centennial Group. And they were able to express some of their thoughts about these activities and what's happening right now. And also how um, their own communities are not benefiting from the um, visitors that come there and the, the amount of money that the visitors spend in the Grand Canyon, the National Park, 
And how does this cross marketing happen where the communities can decide um, what they want visitors to see, where they want visitors to be, um, but also that their, their communities are promoted within the park or from the, the actual um, promotion and marketing of the Grand Canyon National Park itself and how do they include some of the communities that want to be promoted in that way. So I'm going to see, stop and see if anybody, okay, there's a couple of questions. Um, oh, Valerie is asking, were the prices made by you or them? And I think you're talking about my personal experience. It was always them. Um, I remember my, my aunt would try to negotiate sometimes. And um, it's funny because there's, she would sometimes, whenever we went on these trips, she would either tell us, you need to come with me in the store. And she would always, you know, like, don't run around, don't touch nothing, you know, giving us that whole, um, don't be crazy yeah, Indians. <laughs> um, so there were times she knew the, the buyers. So either sometimes the buyers liked kids. And so having us there was helpful to her in making the sales. But there were other times there are certain stores. And I still remember those stores when I go to Sedona that we were not allowed to go into um, because the buyer did not want kids in their stores. And so we would be waiting outside for hours. <laughs> it seemed like hours. It probably was only like 20 minutes. But you know how we are, kids. We'd be waiting outside for for a long time for you know for with my aunt to be inside the store. So I can share many experiences with you about that, about breaking down in Prescott, and we spent like two days walking around trying to sell jewelry so we could get our car fixed, <laughs> um, things like that. So, um, and then um, Marco has another comment about seeing seen a lot of what in the stores, Marco? Um, we see a lot of that, like um, traditionally that happen about um, individuals who come in and they um, are looking to sell their work and they price their, their jewelry really low, like really, really low. And um, I mean, sure, there's a lot of reasons for that, but sometimes they'll indicate that, you know, this is what such and such um, company will buy it for. And most of them are gonna be like on like border towns. And so they're kind of taught like that um, to price their stuff like pretty low. So I'll tell them, I mean, like if you're gonna be doing that, then you're going to be creating this mentality from people that they're gonna expect those prices to be kind of low. And you're also gonna give, you're gonna basically leave that money to that third person who is the um, uh, the the person who's gonna be like, I don't know, the pawn shop or the retailer that's gonna be there. And usually they'll tell me what stores and they're not, of course they're non-native stores. So that's that's what I see a lot. So when I when people come in, I do, talk to them about margins. I talk to them about wholesaling, about how do you price that? How much do you put your time into that? So kind of that's how I help. help. Thank you, Marco. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely a skill in, um, well, one, valuing your work, but I think a lot of people know the value of their work. It's just a matter of like, the skill of being able to say, this is what I want, this is how much I want to be paid and, and understanding why, you know, it's yep. not just about the, the cost of materials, there's also a time of, amount to it. And then it's not just about that too, it's, it's a lot of how do you even value, you know, the skill that you have, or how do you value the, um, the, the, um, the knowledge that goes into making that product. Because, you know, you don't make jewelry just by, by one day saying you're going to make jewelry. Like, you have to learn a lot about what goes into it and how to work with the materials. And all of that experience um, that you're getting when you're doing that needs to be valued in some way. And so I think that's one of the things that people forget about. And we have... Um, Going to the next comment, Shana's daughter is listening to us. So, hi. <laughs> we have extra audience members here. These are just some of the common themes that we talked about at Emergence. And there's others, but um, I didn't want to 
get into too much of that, um, we will be putting out a report about emergence. So if you want that, um, send me an email and I can make sure that you get a copy of that when that's completed. So the next thing, what I wanna do here is ask the question about um, how important is tourism to your community, the community that you come from? And I don't know, oh, there's the, the poll. Go ahead and um, answer the poll. And while you're doing that, um, I'll go back here and um, kind of explain some of the, the pictures here. Um, we had community members as close as Cameron, um, and we had a discussion about how Cameron is a gateway community, but we also learned um, from some of the people that came from Cameron that they don't necessarily want to see themselves as a gateway to community to the Grand Canyon. They actually want to see, they want to see themselves more as a gateway to the Navajo Nation, and also that they um, not just for tourism, not just for visitors, but also the entire region, they want to see, they want to act as a gateway between, you know, the, the community of Flagstaff and the Navajo and Hopi. Um, so, you know, they want to put more, they want to increase some of their, um, their retail and their um, services right there at the junction there, because they know the amount of people that pass through there going from the northern parts of the nation, um, the chapters, you know, Tuba City, but also all the way to Page and the city of Flagstaff. And so it's not always just about tourism, but it's more about, you know, how can we increase the services, um, the location, because of the location that they are, how do they increase services, even for people that live in the region? Um, and how can they be become sort of brand their community to be like, we're the gateway to not just the Navajo Nation, but to went to Hope, um, Flagstaff, um, and then vice versa, we're also the gateway to the Navajo Nation from the communities of Flagstaff and from the Grand Canyon. So it's more dynamic than just tourism and, and catering to visitors. I thought that was really cool. Um, we had, um, some people that were as far as, um, were from as far as Zuni. Zuni has a lot of their stories and their culture is um, surrounding the Grand Canyon. And so they consider a lot of those places as sacred and were really do wanna connect themselves um, to the Grand Canyon and to their community and have done quite a bit of work to do that. They, they're actually one of the first um, indigenous communities that's part of the grand or part of the um america main street program and um the main street program is a is a federal program that provides support to uh, communities on route 66 on historic route 66 so they've done a lot of work to to develop a tourism um a place where tourists can visit and learn about their, their community. But because they're far away from the Grand Canyon, they have a hard time um, inviting people into their community. And so they're hoping to, to, to develop some partnerships with the Grand Canyon. Um, and then of course we did have a vendors fair um, there at the Grand Canyon. There's a lot of um, activity around that that's happening where, um, the Native Americans for Community Action, which is an organization out of Flagstaff, they manage the vending space at the um, at the Overlook, right outside between um, Flagstaff and Sedona, the Oak Creek Overlook. They manage the vending spaces there. They do it through a lottery. Um, some of you might be familiar with that process, um, but they're in the process of signing a partnership with the Grand Canyon National Park to actually open up some vending spaces in the Grand Canyon. And that's going to be the first time that a national park across the country is going to have a partnership with an indigenous organization, and that's going to have space available for vendors. They used to do it many years ago, but they but no national park has has that in in the country. So it'll be the first time. So it's actually being reviewed by the highest levels in the national park or in the Department of the Interior. 
um, because it will be used as a um, sort of a pilot project for other national parks, but they also say they know that once they have that in place, other national parks are going to want, want to do that. So really exciting um, opportunities coming available for uh, Indigenous entrepreneurs and vendors and artists. And so um, if you're interested in any of that, then um, you can let me know and I can direct you to anybody who can answer your questions or um, get you the information you need. Delfina says um, La Chi totally thrives from tourism um, with Antelope Canyon and Horseshoe Bend. Valerie feels torn about it. And Leander says very important to the community. And Valerie says it's good for us to do the work acknowledging the impact on our communities. Um, Valerie, do you wanna make a comment about that? Um, yeah, I think it's just like, I mean, I feel like they bring disease. <laughs> they bring trash, they bring these, you know, creating a different, the impact to the community where like the trash, Navajo Nation doesn't even have a recycle center. Um, we're not like these other quote unquote, you know, like Sedona, like Flagstaff, where they have there, it feels like they're, they, they bring in like the environment, like make sure that you're not, you know, um using too much water here's the recycling bins here's what we have for you and they're able to bring in that infrastructure even so more like even with their food right like i find organic at all these places and we have none of that on navajo and nobody really talks about that or anything so i think that's where it definitely gets me upset however knowing those it's good for us to do that work and that more of the younger people are are wanting and willing to do this and that they just need that help kind of like what um the prior per, uh, uh we're saying like this is how you kind of go about it you know what i mean like come on let's get this going and i think that's where you know change labs and having this, these discussions are really good because it can lead to those better avenues and definitely the revenue and having us do the work having the money come back to us versus an outside entity that ends up just taking all the money again just like with the jewelry you know it just it does kind of get me upset when I hear some of those things because it is really hard when you do notice that people sell you know some of their earrings that are really nice for like $25 or even a hundred dollars and that's nothing compared to what it's being sold off res or to all these other places at three, five hundred dollars and just them not knowing. And that's, you know, just more, I guess, more education. And that's where it's kind of like we need to have those people that are are willing and able to to bring in the work and make it work for uh, themselves, not only for themselves, but maybe impacting community that way where we can get our own, you know, better um trash services have the recycling or something like that where it really impacts that where we can get better things for Navajo as well in their you know in the community yeah I think that's um part of I think I mean one that's a really good point about we don't have the services to um accommodate visitors in our communities and so it ends up to be um sort of these less than ideal situations where community where visitors are catered to versus the service services being provided to the people that live there um so i think that's a big that's it's definitely a risk of the tourism industry um and one of the that came up in the discussion around infrastructure like even having the um the ability to to invite visitors in having the roads, having the water lines, having the water available, um, but making sure that those things are not built just because there's a tourism industry, but be, but um, in partnership with tourism developers or saying, you know, we could benefit, the, the community could benefit from tourism if it also brought these this, these, this infrastructure with it. Well, last thing, remember when that was all huge too, when they wanted the electric cars thing and everybody was pissed because it was going to cost like millions or so, you know, a huge amount of money. And they're like, why are you doing that? And it was again for outsiders. How many Navajos have a freaking Tesla? Come on, man. 
you know? And then when you come to that point, you're like, hold up, hold up, hold up. We need to have the water line, bathroom. You know, we have such basic needs that when that did come up, it was like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The money. And it's also driven by federal policy. That's just not, you know, in line with what we, what we have. Um, Cause there still is money and grants out there for communities to um, to put in electric vehicle charging stations. Um, but yeah, you'll have an electric vehicle charging station right next to, you know, a place that doesn't even have a parking lot that's paved, <laughs> something like that. Um, Holly, go ahead. Yeah, I think Val brought up like a really good point because like also to you, um, what a quick fix to a lot of that bringing in that in your infrastructure or like just manifesting that in a, in a quick way it ends up going to other quote-unquote evils of like fast food convenience stores things are not really healthy alternatives but instead there are things that do end up bringing that into the community because you know to build some sort of fast food chain like they have to have a certain infrastructure built and that's easy to have a lot of money thrown into that of having one of those water lines having those parking um, parking lots um those basic needs of electricity brought into those types of places and those are super quick fixes and i don't understand why we don't it, it like those are achievable while doing that for a small business owner as like a plaza area for other businesses in the community to to have those as accessible places for them to sell instead of on the side of the road in flea markets flea markets that are uh break down like they can be broken down and just like honestly just a carport that they're selling under like i think that's like not okay because why do we treat that? I think that just speaks volumes of how we value those individuals over some sort of corporation that, you know, again, it's not unknown that like the health benefits from a fast food restaurant to an actual local eatery, like there's huge differences between those two and have the impact of that community having a staple restaurant like that's what also brings in tourism is these unique places that you can't find everywhere else like all around the world a mcdonald's is going to be a mcdonald's um you know so having these unique places that's what that was the idea first around downtown um like places um in in cities or townships is having a downtown of those localized unique businesses to that area but like I just don't understand sometimes that we we just immediately go to, oh, we need to have this fast food place into here or this car wash, huge conglomerate business chain into our communities for convenience versus like trying to build that or help build businesses into that um, to those structures uh, instead of just having them stay for generations underneath carports. <laughs> like wow. I am. I'm shocked that the Gallup flea market still doesn't have concrete. <laughs> I mean, like these places that like are market spaces that don't have concrete, knowing how 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 many years they've existed. Thanks, Holly. Let me go ahead and go to Delphina and then we can talk a little bit more about the um the investments that these that these opportunities will take. Good afternoon. Um, I myself come from the Lechii community, and obviously our biggest thriving economic development is tourism. Um, we are, when I first came there um, working for a small Navajo business-owned company there, there was probably less than 10 companies running, uh, featuring Antelope Canyon and Horseshoe Bend. Now we have over 10. Um, I can tell you that we do put, they, we did put a lot of money we did the 6% 6, 6 sales tax to the Navajo Nation. Um, on average, in a year, we probably gave them 6% tax, about 100,000 plus. So imagine 100,000 average times 10. We've already, in the Chi itself, we've already gave them uh, what, almost a million dollars just along with the tourism. So it, then when you go look at that, and it goes into the general fund they divert that dollar amount into each chapter again, individually by voters registrations. So then you get the money allocated into um, your own chapter house. 
And some of those things, obviously, um, I hear you guys talk about infrastructure. That's really important because at my work, my office, when I was there, I had no running water and electricity. We utilize generators to operate our daily operation as well as solar. And we finally got the electric lines in and they're still waiting on water. So it is hard. We spent a lot of operating costs alone just cleaning um, the porta johns. Um, we probably spent like at least fifty thousand dollars a year um, keeping the internal cl cleanup of the um, of the area of our, our tour companies. So a lot of these infrastructures, I think, um, is needed, is necessary, and we just all need to be on top of it and advocate it to our council delegates. But um, I feel like the tourism itself and the just featuring the destination types of things, um, they do make a lot of money. We do, they, 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 those small Navajo owned companies do contribute a lot to their 6% sales tax. And also um, Navajo Nation Park and Rec, if you have an operating agreement, um, you are to pick up at least at the time, um, I think it's $6, now it's $8 per permit. So the Navajo Nation Park and Rec actually get that proceeds to their department. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an audit report about a full audit report in the Antelope Canyon telling you how much those dollar amounts were. And it wasn't um, in compliance at that time. So I just want to just heads up on that. Um, a lot of that, I think, I, I feel like a lot of the torque operators would be a great asset to do more input and studies for the economic development in that type of area. Thank you, Delphina. And I I, I love all the comments that are in the chat. Um, and I kind of just wanted to share Jerry's comment because I think it kind of brings everything together that, that the, the Navajo Nation is not structured to be business oriented. So the funds that go into the council, like Delphine mentioned about, they go into the general fund. And this is this is the same thing with most tribal nations. Um, Hopi's the same way, although I don't think Hopi has a sales tax, but um, they do have you know fees that they attach to businesses that creates a revenue. But the revenues that go into the tribe don't, there's not a way for them to, there's not a path that would go to support the things that will actually support all of the issues that everybody's bringing up today. So that was one of the reasons that we um, hosted Emergence was so that the we could start talking about these, these issues and talking about the way tourism has an impact on our communities, but what can we do to build a tourism industry that works for us? And I think the idea of you know having fast food or inviting industries or companies or um, or stores and food places that that aren't necessarily what we want, um, we can have we have agency over that, right? If we live in our communities, we can we have the power to say we don't want that type of um, we don't want another fast food place here. We want to support an entrepreneur that can provide an experience. Um, for visitors and for people who live in the community um, to cook food that's that's good for you, that's local, which also supports local um, farmers. Um, it supports, it might support local burrito lady, it might support a local baker. Um, so how do we build that kind of economy where we're where we're supporting each other, and that how does how do our leaders create the policies that support that? So how do we get money so that we do have a trash service in our communities, so that when we do have more people coming into our communities, it doesn't build up trash? How do we, you know, um, build a road, or how do we put concrete at the flea market? How do we build a road that is um, you know, that can accommodate thousands of people. If you even look at the um, the Navajo Nation Fair, right? The fairgrounds. It's like, how, how can we, how have we not been able to build the facilities that we need to invite our own people to our capital to, to, to experience a celebration of our lives, our people, our culture, our politics, everything. And yet we don't have the facilities to accommodate them. 
Like what, what is going on there that's not working for the benefit of the people and for the benefit of um, all the people that take it, that take part in that. So it is, you know, definitely awe-inspiring as Sahar mentioned, there's, there's such a big potential and it's really an industry that's, that could be about us. Like we could do this for us. We could do it. It could be about us. And we don't have to just accept what normal tourism industry um, people say about, well, you need, you know, a fast food place. You need, um, you need this, you need that, you know, we could, we could say, we'll decide what we need because we'll decide how visitors are managed, where they're managed, and to make sure that that benefits our own communities. So it's 1230. So we only have about 30 minutes. So I want to get to this next activity and this next um, this is a huge opportunity for anybody who's interested, or if you know people who are interested, one of the main reasons the National Park um, partnered with us was because there's a, um, and one of the tours that we did, in addition to the Desert View, we did a tour of what's called the Powerhouse Complex. So it's, it's a historical complex at the National, at the, the Grand Canyon. If you're familiar with the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon Village is there. That's where the hotels are. The Hopi House is there. Um, that's right at the beginning where the Bright Angel Lodge um, trail is. But it's where most of the tourists come. When they come here, they go to the village. And so this complex is right across the street from... Um, right across the street or right across the rail line from the village. So um, if I, if you're looking at the map here, up where it says where you can't see the historical utility complex, all that area up there on top of this page would be where the village is. So it's where the hotel is, where the, um, it's a Fred Harvey hotel, it's a historic hotel, everybody wants to stay there. It's super expensive. Um, but that's over here, right in where the village is. So this complex was built in the 1920s, as you can see, even as, as old as 1905, which is when the mule barn was there. This is where all the mules are that take the people down into the trails. Um, that's still there. All these buildings are still here, but the only thing that's still operating as what's here is the mule barn. Um, so you'll see they still have mules over on this, this end of this complex, which is one of the issues that people have, like you can't really put a restaurant there because you can smell meals. <laughs> you can smell the, the donkeys. Um, but that used to be the powerhouse complex, which is that building um, in the center top part. That's this house, this, that's what's in this picture here. And this is where um, the old, when they used to power, the electrical power used to come from steam. So they have these huge, this huge equipment that's housed inside this building. And it's still in there. And historically, they want to keep it in there because it still has all the like dials and stuff. Um, but there's still also a huge, there's a second floor. And it's just a huge building. So there's a lot of uses for it. So that's here, we toured the inside of that building. There's the Fred Harvey Laundry. Um, and all of these buildings are that historic architecture of the, um, the rock, um, where they built buildings from the rocks. As you can kind of see from some of the, the pictures here, um, very similar to this picture. You can tell the, the building is made of rock. Um, all of these buildings are still there and they they would like they're looking for a new use for these buildings but so the but is one it's going to cost about 30 million dollars to even get these buildings to um to to be useful to 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 take it to pass inspection to have people go in there because they're so old there's some remediation that needs to be done like lead paint and asbestos and things like that. Um, so 
Well, it's a huge opportunity because this is where, you know, the Grand Canyon rail line comes right into here. And many, many years ago, some of the people that were at Emergence, oh, El Tobar, that's the hotel. Thanks, Jerry. The many years ago, the they used to, I don't know if you guys have seen photos, I should have got a photo, but they had the train come in and then they'd have um, native people sitting on the ground. <laughs> all along the rail line and that they would have their blankets out like they do still do in old town um albuquerque and santa fe they had their jewelry on blankets on the ground that's what they used to do with the grand canyon rail line and it used to be right right here right to the north of this um of this complex so it used to be that you know they could buy directly from the people there and they stopped that of course they stopped that to appease concessionaires um but now they're trying to figure out a way to sort of bring that back and they also want to develop the powerhouse complex in partnership with um the tribes or native people they want this base to be there for to increase the um, cultural representation of native people um and um provide some kind of economic um, impact um, to native entrepreneurs or, or the tribes. So some questions, Valerie said, how many millions did they send for the house in DC? <laughs> I believe this would at least bring funding back in. Um, Sasha said the Navajo Nation could invest into and make a spot for native vendors. And Jerry wants to know, is National Park Service asking new tenants to pay for the renovation of the powerhouse? So they're not asking them to pay for the renovation. They think that the, they could ask the federal government to put it into their, their budget because it's such a huge, huge expense. But they are part of the, the federal government. These are federal buildings. Um, so they would the federal government would pay for the renovation or the um, they think they could get them to put the money in the budget if there was a um, a clear benefit to the tribes. So they're looking for proposals or they will be looking for proposals because this does still have to go through, you'd have to get a concessionaire contract, it'd have to go through negotiations with the national park. But they're just, they're just now starting to look at this and this opportunity. And I agree with Marco about the way Santa Fe and Old Town have natis, native artists sitting on the ground. I hate that too. And then I also am like, why do they still do it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand why they still do it. And I'm glad people see that the opportunity, you know, that that's there for, yeah, Black Smith Shop, trimming meals at the Grand Canyon. Oh, wow, Leander, that's a really good idea. So some of the ideas that came from emergence participants were, you know, something similar to a skywalk or um, talking about Antelope Canyon or market, the, more about the marketing, um, looking at Wallapai's public relations, Route 66 community, gateway communities, and a swap meet or flea market. Um, some of the sales, cultural demonstrations, food, clothing, craft sales, some people talked about an education center where they had um, where tribes could have the opportunity to be represented and have that as their own. They manage the representation for their own communities there, um, welcoming visitors to their home, um, having a visitor center. There is going to be a tribal visitor center that's being built right now, um, but that's going to go over at Desert View over at the res area. <laughs> Um, a multi-purpose event space there at the Grand Canyon, um, and also um, interactive tours where people could hear directly about the story of the tribes that consider the Grand Canyon sacred or to be able to experience using technology. A lot of people talked about using technology to, um, to have tribes share their stories. Um, interpretation, um, performances, youth services, school history, tribal tours, training, education, and evening programming. You guys have a lot to say. Nate said the Navajo Washington, Washington office funding came from the trust, oh, land trust fund. 
is the national park going to allow ownership of the building? Um, no, it would be a lease very similar to being, national parks operate very similar to reservation land or trust land. Um, so they really can't give away any of the land or the buildings, but they can lease out. And the contracts that the concessionaires have are like 30 year contracts, 50 year contracts. I think one of the longest is a, like a 90 year contract. So that's what makes it hard for, let's say somebody wants to come in and take over the contract at the Hopi house. They have to wait for that contract to be up and that contract's probably not going to be up till for another 50 years. The powerhouse was under a contract that expired recently. The complex was under com uh, another contract that recently expired. And so that's why it's open and available right now. So this really is a once in a generation um, opportunity. Jerry says, if the powerhouse is utilized by Arizona tribes, it would be very positive impact, leaving a permanent imprint for visitors who will interact there with natives directly. Um, she likes that it's near the meal house. <laughs> Maybe we could have a small corral of sheep for shearing demonstrations and wool carting. Yeah, you could put people to work. I think people would love that. <laughs> um, Sahar is envisioning what the buildings could be if money and time were not the hurdle. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's imagine that you all are now developers who are going to develop the, count, the Grand Canyon Powerhouse Complex. Time and money is not an issue. They're brand new buildings. They're, um, they have, you know, they're, they're moving ready. And um, what would you do to develop that space? So let's first start. So I'm going to put this map back up here. And this is, of course, an aerial map. I think one of the one of the really cool ideas we've already heard is a blacksmith shop to do farrier services and trimming the meals. Leander, do you want to kind of explain what that is for people who don't know? I act like I know, but I I know a little bit. But <laughs> so um, so one of my uh, business that I kind of that I started guides farrier service and. You know, seeing that blacksmith shop there at Grand Canyon, you know, it'd be it'd be great to um to uh, go go up go up there and trim the the mules there that go down the Grand Canyon, put shoes on them, and also uh, I'm a, I I am also a, a blacksmither to where I do shape my own shoes. I do hot and cold shoeing, so I I think that would be a great opportunity to use that blacksmith shop there and you know, trim the horses and the mules there that go up and down the trail of Grand Canyon. That's awesome. The Grand Canyon has had, um, I, I'm sure they have a contractor that does those mules, but they've been accused of not caring for those mules in the right way. Um, and, you know, so that would definitely be a way of um, having an Indigenous artist provide a service that people could see and experience and, you know, appreciate for, for what it actually represents, which, which is caring for the animals there, the animals that carry these people down into the canyon. So we have a blacksmith shop, so that would stay the same. There's probably equipment in there. I didn't see the inside of that building, but there's probably old equipment still in there. Um, even just uh, throwing out the traditional side of the creation stories of the horse too, you know, that could be utilized on that in that matter too. So, you know, there's a lot of great stories that come from uh, horses and mules uh, using their feet. So that is awesome. I'm writing this down. I was going to put little stickies on, but I'll probably have to do that later. I think it would also be cool to like um, using the blacksmith shop to to do um, demonstrations of like silversmiths and that people like think it's this glamorous work and it's really hard work. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not, you know, your back hurts, you get cuts on your fingers, you, you burn yourself, you just using a, a buffer 
buffing machine to buff silver is like a hazard <laughs> because you could you could poke your eye out. <laughs> There's all these these things about how to make jewelry, and it, I think that people would really appreciate what goes into it if they actually saw what handmade jewelry actually is when you're when they're making it. So I think we all agree on a <laughs> Marco just cut his finger. <laughs> Marco's working right now, and I jinxed him. Um, so blacksmith shop would be cool. It's also like, you know, a way to tell stories about caring for the animals, um, and what the sheep or not the sheep, but the horses and the mules mean in terms of the storytelling. I love that. And it could be in, you could have these like digital versions of, you know, a place where people could visit the shop, but it's also, you know, where they access sort of a, um, they go part of a tour where, you know, it's interactive and they say in this shop, this is what it is, but this is what it is now. And the, these are the stories or have somebody, an actual storyteller there. Um, okay. So that's a great idea. Does anybody else, Holly is throwing out a tea shop or handmade homemade soap with local herbs and education on plants native to the area and like a tea cafe for local items. I love that idea because one of the um, one of the main concerns about tourism and especially the um, the river guides, the guides that go down the river into the canyon is that they're not doing anything that benefits the protection of these areas. And that's the ICCG group, the Intertribal Centennial Group is um, concerned about that, that if we're gonna be inviting tourists and visitors into these spaces, they should know, they should be educated about the sacred spaces. They should be educated about the plants. They should be educated about the land. They should be educated about the water so that that activity is actually benefiting the protection of these spaces. And so it's sort of this, again, an indigenous view of what a traditional tourism um, activity would be. And so I, I love that idea because, again, it's an opportunity to educate people on the local plants and on how we as indigenous people have used these plants um, since, you know, before the National Park was even there. Jerry, do you want to add to that? Sorry. So back in 2001, I believe was the Winter Olympics at Salt Lake City. And I had the opportunity to work at the Discover Navajo Pavilion there for people who visited the um, the state and also, you know, learn more about the culture. But within the pavilion, we actually had a Navajo timeline, you know, our story, our interpretation of the Dine people and who we are today. And you start off with the timeline um, all the way going back to our history and also the long walk and also some of the government influences like boarding school. But you, the person had a chance to walk this timeline as they're going through the pavilion. And then they also got a chance to learn more about Navajo and all the different crafts. So when you went into the Hogan, someone was inside the Hogan and they explained to you what the Hogan meant to us being in a female Hogan and what it represents. And then you come out of the Hogan, you go, you know, then you start going into um, another timeline where we had a lot of military men and women who have served and really recognizing the tribe as not just um, warriors, but um, protecting the land and our homeland. And then you go into an area where you have a demonstrator, someone who's doing silversmith, and then the next little area has a little rug weaver and they're carding wood and, you know, all the different um, skills that we have as people. And that by the end, you kind of see what we are today as far as our kids, you know, thriving in these sports and businesses and really making record in the um, American society. You know, I think that they really get to see the timeline of where we began uh, from the four, actually, you start with the emergent story. Immediately you go into a video with the four worlds. That's, we go into a dark room, and I really like that setup. And I, I learned a lot just being Navajo, you know, talking to pe people there. And I could just see something like that here with this big space and building. I'm not saying necessarily we should 
focus on Navajo, but it could be a story of the tribes here in Arizona. We get a chance to tell our story our way and not from anyone who wrote a textbook. I, I think on that, Jerry, I think I saw something similar. Um, maybe it was the same, same kind of art inspired uh, thing, but it was like an indigenous um, of all the indigenous tribes, I think to North America in general, that it had like, depending on where you entered from of the building, it had that, that uh, culture's emergent story to what is the current um, world today. And so I think that'd be really cool because like, then you could expand it to where you're not just focusing on Navajo, you could focus on the other tribes that called that area home. Mm -hmm. And have that emergent story, depending on where you like enter this, you know, this function from, you could be going through each per, each uh, culture and people's like emergent story to this world through that way, um, to, to ultimately the center of taking it to uh, what it looks like today. Exactly. And tribes are um, seasonal. You know, a lot of the dances are based around different ceremonies and different, like right now we have Yaibuche season and the Hopi, our neighbors here, they have the Kachinas dances going on during the winter time. So there, it could be a seasonal thing where, you know, depending on what that tribe is doing, have some of the, the Kachina dances because that's the winter time right now. Have a Yaibuche dance because it's the winter time right now. But you know, we still practice all of the traditional songs and dances within our areas, but this would be one place to showcase it for visitors. You know, it doesn't have to be a big grand scale, but maybe one or two performances a month and, and just to show them that this is what the tribes are doing currently in Arizona. While you're here at the South Rim, you get a little glimpse of it. Yeah, I really love those ideas and um, the way that, see, this is exactly what doesn't happen there is they say, oh, we want to have this, um, you know, we want to represent the cultures of Native people, but they don't invite Native people to that planning. And one of the, um, they did that, they made that mistake originally with Desert View. And once they actually, they've learned that mistake, they learned from that because what they, they, they created this plan for Desert View. And then when they actually put together a working group of the staff of native people that work at the canyon, they ended up, they, you know, once they presented that, that plan, they were like, no, <laughs> you can't do that for these reasons. And so they had to redo their whole entire plan. And one of the discussions I had with somebody there was like, you need to invite native people to design these projects for you. You can't even design the projects, even if it's, and they, and they were sort of like, well, you know, we, we try to work with, um, we try to make sure that who we hire the design group that they hired had a native person that was in there that worked for them. And I said, it's exactly what Jerry said about a chant, you know, the, the way we tell our stories, we tell them our way and what Deidre put in there about, um, building story walks that are available to all tribes that want to share their creation stories and historical timelines. Just the way that we think about these things is different from the way that anybody else does. And I told, when I was standing there with them, we were standing at this complex. One of the things I said to them was don't make any decisions. Don't do anything unless you hire, until you hire a native designer. Because I said, it's that native designer that's going to come in here and they're going to feel what's in the ground. They're going to feel that land that they're walking on. They're going to feel what's in these buildings. They're going to feel it. And it's a feeling that nobody else can, can experience. And that's why you need somebody who's a native designer. And that, and it's because they don't, they don't, they don't, these ideas don't come to them. Um, these ideas don't come about that and so uh, they don't they it's like oh let's you know let's do this for native culture but it's not really built with native culture at the heart of it so um i love all of these ideas um and if you all again you know if you want to have more discussions or if you want to um be part of the continued discussion with emergence or with um, an intertribal 
economic tourism alliance that we're, um, we're actually trying to put together as well um, with a, Emergence and the, the people that, kind of, that came to Emergence last year. Um, we're doing that now, so let me know. I did also um, want to say thank you to everybody again for participating and for coming to this discussion and um, sharing your ideas, sharing the space with us. And um, it, again, feel free to email me. My email's there if you want to have, um, if you have any other thoughts. And that's it. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica, for your presentation. I was going to share my screen, but it's the same thing as Jess's screen. It's just my name at Raquel, Raquel at nativestartup.org. <clears throat> um, then thank you to everyone else who is here today um, for taking the time to join our discussion and for your questions and all your participation. If you missed any part of Jessica's presentation, uh, we'll have this session um, posted to Chains Lab YouTube channel soon, as soon as we have the um, the final edit ready and uploaded. <clears throat> and then if you missed any part of my presentation or if you have any questions about Change Labs or the discussion today, um, definitely feel free to email Jessica. Um, she offered her email address. You can also email myself if you have any questions about Change Labs other services. <clears throat> um, my email would be Raquel at nativestartup.org. And then I do have another workshop coming up that's going to be on February 8th. And I will have that link set up. It's not set up right now. I will have it ready very soon. Um, by the end of the week, I'll say by the end of the week, this week, on February 8th, I will be talking about financial projections. So if you have any questions about your business's financial projections, um, keep that in mind and mark your calendar. <clears throat> so if anything else, let me check the chat box one more time. Yes, yeah, so thank you for everyone everyone's participation. I will say goodbye to y'all for now. You guys be safe. Have a safe trip home or in all your travels. <clears throat> we'll see you guys next time. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.